This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk a little bit about proof of work versus proof of stake. I've been getting a lot of questions about this, and to start it off, I want to begin with an example. This is a picture of Fort Knox, where the U.S. stores most of its gold at the moment. The way the gold is protected, you have two electric fences, two non-electric fences, video cameras. I won't read all of this. Uh, Four-foot granite walls. 22-ton vault door, the combo spread out across multiple people, and then you have this basically on an army base where there are 26,000 uh, soldiers stationed. So that is one model of security. When you see this, and when you see this picture and hear these statistics, what's your immediate reaction? If you're normal, your first thought is probably, wow, this is really secure. The only way to really attack this gold would be to nuke the location. But otherwise, only a crazy person would try to break in and steal this gold. It's really not possible. Or is your reaction, if you're like a mainstream media journalist, wow, this is clearly a waste of both energy and manpower. This is the double standard that we see applied to gold and Bitcoin when they're talking about the energy that's used to secure Bitcoin's value. It's always considered to be a waste of energy. And these sort of trade-offs are not uh, are not ever considered. The other people who are constantly attacking proof of work in Bitcoin are people who have something to sell you, people like Vitalik and Charles Hoskinson, who each printed up their own money and are trying to dump it on people and while, while con uh, concern trolling about how much energy usage uh, Bitcoin does. There's never this trade-off uh, or discussion about whether that energy is a good use of energy. And especially for the journalists who write about Bitcoin and uh, other people like that who don't really understand Bitcoin and think that Bitcoin is useless, any usage, usage of energy, whether it's green or not, and however tiny, will always be too much for these people. You're never going to make them happy, and so it might not even be worth it arguing with them. You could show them this picture. So we have, we have uh, one way to store gold. Here's another way to store gold. Uh, you could store it under your bed. Of course, this doesn't scale. It's not very secure, etc. But it does use a whole lot less energy. So maybe it's a better way to store gold. Similar debates are happening around proof of work and proof of stake. It is true that proof of work is much more energy intensive. You have to run these Bitcoin mining rigs to find a hash or a number that's below a certain number. And there's really no way to cheat on this or no way to calculate it. You just have to do a brute force operation where you run the computer and burn a lot of electricity. And basically, when you come up with this hash, it is proof that you expended a lot of energy doing it. Now, rather than being a bug, this is actually a feature of Bitcoin. These large amounts of energy that are consumed make it very expensive and difficult to rewrite the Bitcoin blockchain. It's very difficult and expensive to rewrite the first, uh, the tip of the blockchain, those the couple blocks there, and it's almost impossible to envision someone rewriting the whole blockchain. And this is secured by the energy that you would need to expend to rewrite the blockchain. There's no way to cheat. Basically, it's like mining for gold. If you have a piece of gold in your possession, it means you either paid a lot of money for it or you went to the hard work of digging it out of the ground. Proof of stake is very different. It's basically just a signature from someone who's a validator. A validator is the equivalent of a miner, someone who validates a block. In order to become a validator, you need to put up at least 32 ETH, which at today's prices is roughly $64,000. And then you have all these validators. The, uh, the new Ethereum system under proof of stake uh, will ask one of these validators randomly to verify a block. If they verify the block correctly and they don't cheat, they will get paid a reward in ETH. If they uh, try to cheat and they don't follow the consensus rules when verifying the block, the system will confiscate some of their ETH. This is obviously much less energy intensive, but it does have a lot of problems, which we're going to talk about in this video. If you're finding this video helpful so far, please hit that subscribe and like button and maybe share this video with a few friends. I'll link here to the official ethereum.org uh, page on how to become an Ethereum validator. Proof of stake, I should say, is still unproven. Only Bitcoin, only a proof of work currency has been able to secure a trillion dollars in value. 
it's not clear whether proof of stake will break. Will there be some incentive that undermines it once really large values of money are stored in it? No one knows because no proof of stake coin has ever gotten to 600 billion where, where Bitcoin is now or a trillion uh, as it was, not, not ETH, not Cardano, etc. So there is quite a bit of risk, I think, sticking around in ETH and watching this trans this transition from proof of work to proof of stake, which looks to me like it's it's happening this summer. Another problem with proof of stake is it leads to more centralization. Proof of stake is great for people like Vitalik, who already own a lot of ETH. This is a system in which the rich get richer. As I've talked about in other videos, and I'll link to them below, ETH had a huge pre-mine. It was done in a very corrupt way to begin with. And now those same people who were awarded large amounts of ETH at the beginning without having to do any work, those same, same people can just stake their ETH, sit on their hands, and get richer. What about people who like ETH who don't have 32, uh, 32 ETH? They are not allowed to become a validator. So this really is a, a, a different class system or a two-class system. By contrast, they always say it's difficult to set up a Bitcoin mining operation. You can buy a Bitcoin mining rig right now, from anywhere from 5K to 10K. There is that semiconductor shortage and the mining rig shortage, so maybe you have to pay uh, 20K, but it's still really a third of the price or less of becoming an ETH validator by having to come up with 32,000, uh, 32 ETH. Here's a, here's a good uh, uh, Bitmain ant miner, one of these Bitcoin mining rigs on Amazon for approximately $10,000. So this is the relative price range. I'm also going to link, as I said, to a couple videos that I made about Ethereum's pre-mine, their pre-sale, and their dirty history. So this is one problem with the incentives involved. When you mine your own coin, when you have a big pre-mine, there are a lot of incentives involved in moving to proof of stake because it means these original large stakeholders can make even more money. This leads to even more centralization. We can see if we look at the uh, the staking pools, how this is playing out uh, so much for decentralization. We have Lido, which is the largest pool uh, by many orders of magnitude. They have a market share of about 74% already. And so under the new system, you're really going to need to trust that that this that the Lido Bitcoin mining pool doesn't get together and do something um, do something uh, corrupt. And uh, so this is an example. Even before things have really started, we're already seeing huge centralization in um, in in ETH. This uh, people said this was a problem uh, with proof of work and that China controlled Bitcoin mining. As we're seeing, China has just uh, kicked all the Bitcoin miners out or they're in the process of doing it. Bitcoin has not fallen apart. It would appear that China did not, in fact, control Bitcoin. Another great thing about Bitcoin proof of work, because it's a competitive process, it incentivizes innovation and tech innovation. ETH proof of stake does not. So let's say it's 10 years from now. I want to get started mining one of these. I take a look at ETH. What do I see? I see lots of centralized holders who've gotten rich by staking for the past 10 years. They just put up their ETH and sat back and did nothing and collected the interest income. By contrast, if I want to mine Bitcoin in 10 years from now, if I buy a new, uh, brand new Bitcoin mining rig, I will have an advantage over the incumbents who have old machines because my mining rig is more powerful uh, because it has a more powerful processor and it's a newer machine. So this is the way in which ETH incentivizes sitting on your hands. Bitcoin incentivizes innovation. To win at Bitcoin mining, you need to develop a new, faster, more efficient machine. You need to seek out the cheapest energy sources available on the planet. And this is all, uh, the, the cheaper your energy sources, the more money you will make as well. This is what capitalism looks like. It's highly competitive. There's constant innovation. This is true capitalism, not central bank capitalism, but true capitalism. ETH mining, under proof of stake, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to innovate. You don't need to try to develop a faster chip or seek out cheaper energy. You just need to be rich already, which is basically how the current fiat financial system works. In 10 years from now, you're going to have the same ETH validators, only they're going to be richer and fatter. There's no reason for them to drop out because they don't have to do anything to make money. They just sit there 
Whereas in 10 years from now, there's no guarantee that you'll have the same Bitcoin mining operations. They will be forced out unless they stay competitive. Vitalik loves proof of stake, large beneficiaries of the pre-mine like proof of stake, uh, as Charles Hoskinson does with Cardano, ADA. Another big group that loves proof of stake are the exchanges that are sitting on massive amounts of ETH in their wallets, and they'll be able to, to monetize proof of stake. So it really does favor, uh, it does favor the incumbents. There's also a tax problem with proof of stake. Let me, let me explain it in this way. If I own ETH and I decide not to stake it once ETH has moved to proof of stake, I'm going to fall behind. Now, the reason for this, the reason I'm going to fall behind is because everyone else will be earning interest income in ETH and I won't. That interest income that's being paid to them by the overall Ethereum system is slowly diluting my position because they, they stake their ETH. I didn't. They're making interest income. I'm not. So this basically puts a lot of pressure on ETH hodlers. It forces you, it forces them to stake their coins if they want to keep up. Now, the problem with forcing someone to stake is that there is there are risks involved. You need to either figure out how to do this yourself or you have to trust some big centralized staking pool. So there are risks involved. You might move your uh, your ETH to a big staking pool. They might lose the keys to the to some of the ETH as happened uh, has happened recently. And so these are it's not risk free staking. And if you do it yourself, of course, you can make a mistake. But then again, if you don't stake your ETH, you're going to get diluted by everyone else who is staking their ETH. So in a world of perfectly rational actors, and we should get somewhat close to this, most people will be staking their ETH because it doesn't make any sense not to. So let's say that the market value of all the ETH in the world is uh, moves up over the coming years to one trillion and everyone is staking their ETH and earning 5%. Let's say the whole system, every all the participants are staking their ETH. So that's $50 billion in staking awards every year. Now, what I'm gonna talk about here is not tax advice or anything. I'm not a tax, a tax guy, but it would appear to me at least that staking income, the income, the interest income you receive when you stake your ETH will almost certainly be taxable. It's just like interest income. So let's say that the global average tax rate on that interest income is 20%. That means there's going to be $10 billion due in taxes every year. Now, governments, they choose to be paid in fiat. It's very unlikely they'll accept ETH. That means that $10 billion worth of ETH needs to be sold each year to pay these taxes. It means you need to find new buyers of ETH every single year just to secure the system. It's very different for Bitcoin, which is moving towards a transaction only system once the last Bitcoin is mined in about 100 years from now. Now, people are going to mention EIP uh, 1559, in which uh, a lot of the ETH is going to get burned. These transaction fees are going to get burned. And so this will be uh, or could be deflationary for the system. The thing about this is even if that works and keeps the money supply of ETH, of Ethereum under control, these taxes are still going to be Owed. So proof of stake, in a really weird way, it ensures that there's a steady stream of money going to fiat governments and helping to prop them up. Same thing doesn't happen with Bitcoin. If you're hodling, there are no taxes owed, and there's certainly no pressure to stake your Bitcoin and thus avoid getting diluted by everyone else. There is no dilution. Now, there's another a uh, tax wrinkle here that a lot of people are going to learn the hard way, just as they learn this the hard way with um, with IPOs and stocks. You will need to pay your taxes on your ETH staking income based on its value when it was paid out to you, when you received it. So if you receive one ETH from staking and ETH is currently valued at $4,000 when that happens, you're going to owe taxes on that $4,000 of interest income. Now, let's say over the coming weeks, that ETH drops to 2,000, you're still, the value of one ETH drops to 2,000, you're still going to owe those taxes on $4,000 worth of ETH. This means that there should be constant selling pressure on ETH simply because there's a lot of risk if you don't hedge that ETH that you just earned as an interest income or you don't sell it right away and convert it to fiat. So there are lots of weird things that happen with proof of stake. Finally, there's something very terrible that could happen to 
Ethereum if it does move to proof of stake. Let's, let's look at a situation where the global internet gets partitioned. In this example, I'm going to use Europe, EU, and North America. So let's say the European internet gets separated from the North American internet for a week due to maybe some transatlantic cable gets snipped or there's, there's a war in one place and a war not in the other place. If you get this partition, you'll end up with two blockchains for each currency. You'll end up with a European Bitcoin blockchain and a North American Bitcoin blockchain. Likewise, you'll end up with a European ETH blockchain and a North American ETH blockchain. Now, let's say the internet gets back together. The two internets got re get reconnected. At that point, you have a problem because you have to choose between these chains, which one is the correct chain. They will certainly have different transactions, etc. How do you choose which is the, the correct chain? Under proof of work, it's very easy. It's always the longest chain that wins. It's always the longest chain because to make the chain longer, you have to expend real electricity. You have the real costs. You have to do the work. So the longest chain always wins in Bitcoin. Under proof of stake, there is no way to know which is the official chain. If you have a European ETH chain and a North American ETH chain, there's literally no way to decide which is the official chain once the partition gets reversed. You're going to need some powerful committee, some centralized group, probably Vitalik if he's still around, will need to decide which the official, uh, which one is the official chain. So this is a major problem. Proof of work can function on its own in this very decentralized, objective way. Proof of stake, if you get a partition, there's no way to decide which chain is legitimate. And this could create a real crisis. If you're on the other chain that doesn't get chosen, you uh, have a lot of financial exposure and you could end up, uh, very bad things could end up happening. These are the sort of things that are never discussed when you have these guys pushing proof of stake. They're obviously pushing proof of stake because they own lots of the currency and they want to increase their holdings. Proof of stake is simply an inferior solution to proof of work. In the coming weeks, I'm going to try to think more about the security attacks that you could perform on proof of stake versus proof of work. So if you, if you have any ideas about that, please drop them in the comment section below. Hit that subscribe and like button if you found the video helpful. Let me know your questions and comments. And uh, when you hit subscribe, also hit that notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. Let me know your thoughts on all of this. I'm really curious. And thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next video.